Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those that uh, don't know, know me, and I, I know and recognise a lot of you online, I'm uh, Nicholas Rushton. I'm the leader of the County Council. I've been the leader for 10 and a half years ish now. Uh, with me today to help, I've got Deborah Taylor, who's the deputy leader. Uh, uh, Chris Tambini, who's our Chief Financial Officer, and um, we've also got Lee Brecken, who handles the finances for uh, the group. Uh, as you guys probably know, we're a Conservative-led um, County Council. I appreciate we've got a, a good mixture of people on the, on the call today, but I thank you all for attending. Um, it's useful to touch base with you, it's useful to speak with you, and it's useful to explain our financial predicament uh, to you. So th uh, thanks very much uh, for attending. Uh, apparently this is going on social media later, so uh, if you, all you guys can remember that. When I say guys, I mean ladies as well, so if we can all remember that. Um, I'm on the line from home, so I might not be able to see the hands up because I've got someone to prompt me if there's any hands up. So the normal protocols apply for asking questions. Use the little yellow hand. If you can all keep your microphones off when you're not speaking and on when you are speaking, that'll help the free, free flow of the meeting. But it is an informal meeting. We, we're, here as, we're here as friends. We're all in, in public service. We've not got any points to score. We just want to explain to you uh, where we are. So having said that, I'm going to hand over to Deborah now, who's going to give you a brief outline of where we see the national financial position. Then I think Deborah's going to hand over to uh, Lee Brecken, the fi our finance portfolio holder. And then after that, we're going to have some detailed information from uh, Chris Tambini, who is the C Director of Corporate Finance. So apart from Chris, who is a civil servant, an officer of the County Council. All the rest of us are politicians. So you can shout at me if you want. So you can shout at Deborah, but we, we can't shout or moan at Chris. Chris is just going to set it out uh, straight bat, exactly as it is. So can I hand over to you, Deborah, for the uh, background to the national stuff? Thank you, Leader, and good afternoon to everyone and a happy new year to you all if I haven't wished you that already. So just a, a little bit about the national climate where we find ourselves in. So I'm, I'm sure you're aware that the, the current financial climate is worse than ever and probably far worse than it was for the austerity years that we've been through for the last 10 years or so. So we decided to go to the public early on the scale of the challenge we faced. And I think lots of other local authorities have also followed suit. But obviously for, for us particularly, our problems are far worse, given that we're the lowest funded county in the UK, which is really difficult for us to, to cut any think from um, the bone, we're right down to the cutting into the bone now. So the national finances are not looking in great shape. The Bank of England are warning of uh, the longest recession since records be began. The war in Ukraine is having a huge impact on us and also the cost of living increases really affects the council as well as does everyone else in their own households. So the government's also facing lots of financial challenges and local government finance is probably quite down, low down on the government priority list for support, even though we will continue to do all we can to, to raise the plight of us being the lowest funded county council. So the government will have to do enough to ensure that not too many authorities fall over. I think we're starting to see the beginning of that and probably will get a lot worse during the year. But we're in a, a better position than a lot of local authorities. So we're not on the brink of collapse at all. So we are managing our budgets first, and that's through what we've done over the last few years is to make sure that we keep a really close eye on our finances. And that's why we've decided to go early, do all these webinars with different community groups and yourselves in the out there in the local authority area, just to make sure that we take on board what your thoughts are, any suggestions that you may have. But we all need to work together to get through these next couple of years that are going to be really difficult. So I'll now hand over to Lee Brecken, who's going to give you a little bit more um, indication of our local position here. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just on the local position, our provisional settlement for this year has helped us close the gap for next year and has allowed us to find a way to balance our budget. But we've still got a gap of 17 million going into 24-25 and that rises to 92 million by 26-27. I'm sure Chris will give you the details of that later. Um, our inflationary cost pressures are significant, which is a lot of the problems that we've had to face as an authority. 
Inflation is expected to add another 20 to 30 million per year to our costs as we go forward. And service demand is unrelenting and we've still seen significant growth, especially in those services for our most vulnerable. We do have a good track record of being able to make revenue savings. We've done over £250 million worth of savings off our revenue costs since 2010, and we will continue to pursue ways to make operations and services more efficient. We do have to look at everything. It's a very challenging time for members. As I say, we didn't come into politics or local government for this, but of course we are conscious as well. It comes at the time when people are already struggling to make ends meet. So I think with that short overview, I'll hand now hand over to Chris Tambini. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, thanks, Deborah. So th th this slide kind of sets out some of the headlines that are around kind of before Christmas. They're both national headlines and, and local headlines uh, impact um, setting out kind of what it means for Leicester County Council. What, what, what I would say is, is that our, our position is pretty similar to lots of our other upper tier local authorities. We've got similar pressures. Our Achilles heel is what Deborah said is our low funding position. So our starting position is very is 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 very difficult. You know, we've we've already done a number of service reductions over the last decade or so. We've got no universal youth service. We've got a significant number of our libraries already community run. We've got very tight care packages. So our our baseline starting position does give us a, a particularly kind of difficult um, position over the next kind of two to four years. Get to the next slide, please. This slide kind of sets out some of the headline figures, and I, a lot of these are going to be picked up in terms of later slides. What one thing I will mention is council tax. So the budget proposals we we took to cabinet before Christmas had a five percent increase in council tax for for 23-24, and thereafter it would be reduced down to two percent for the following three years. That is actually pretty similar to a lot of um, other county councils. I think most people are going for five percent, just reflecting the pressures that we that we're, we're all under. The the other thing I'll mention is that we've we've kind of gone public with a two hundred and fifty re reduction in posts. Just to point out, we we don't think we're going to have that much in the way of compulsory redundancies. We think we can go be able to deal with that through kind of um, natural kind of wastage over the years and, and, and vacancies, etc. So although it is it is a reduction in posts, we think we can deal with it in a, in, a, in a reasonable fashion. Next slide, please. Right. Well, our, our, our issue, like um, most councils, is really around inflation. Uh, we've, if, if you look past over the last decade, our, our issue was really around demand with a fairly benign kind of inflationary pressures. Now we've got rising demand and we've got inflation. So the graph on the left kind of shows since 2004 what's happened with in terms of inflation. You can see that big spike starting kind of last last year. It is forecast to have peaked and it's forecast to reduce down. Um, the issue with forecasts is most most of them are generally, are generally inaccurate. So some people are thinking it will kind of level out at 4% and maybe over the medium term and others think it might go negative kind of next year. We'll have to kind of wait and see in terms of what, what, what happens in practice. In terms of what that means for our overall budgetary position, you can see the the, the slide on the right. Our, our key source of income is council tax and even when you've got a 5% increase in council tax there and, and increases 2% thereafter, you can see there's a big gap between that and what the prevailing rate of inflation is, which is 10%. So that gives us a, a, a big issue in terms of addressing and, and, and sorting out our kind of budget gaps. So that's our fundamental pressure, but I expect that's the same pressure that district councils are feeling at the same time anyway. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so this kind of sets that out in a, in a bit more detail. So you can kind of see that the, the key elements of inflation for the county council are pay awards, national living wage, and by national living wage, that's predominantly on external social care contracts and contract inflation. You add those three up altogether, you get to 31 million of emergency, emerging inflationary pressures for 23, 24, which is clearly a significant figure. And on top of that, as I mentioned before, we've got service demands, principally around social care, both adults and children's social care of £17 million. Pounds. So clearly some big pressures on the budget. And as I said, you know, if you look back over the last 10 years, we had the service demand pressure, but not the inflation pressure on top, which which clearly kind of puts us in a, in a much tougher position. 
Well, this slide is a little bit more complicated, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain it. So the, the top line on the on the table is the MTFS gap as in the current MTFS. So you can kind of see we were predicting this time last year that we'd have a gap of about eight million pounds for 23, 24, increasing to 40 million pounds by the time we get to 26, 27. But clearly a lot of things have changed since then. The, the good news is for 23, 24, when you look at all the various changes, the additional savings we put in there, we can balance the MTFS for next year. But that is based on 19 million pounds worth of savings within the MTFS. So, you know, a, a significant challenge to del deliver that level of savings for, the, for next year. Th thereafter, you can see the, the gap increasing. So you look at 24, 25, the starting point was a 24 million pounds gap. Again, additional savings, et cetera, reduce that down to 17 million, which means that the total savings incorporated into the MTFS for 24-25 is 36 million. So again, you know, a, 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 a significant kind of a challenge to achieve that level of, of savings. And as time goes out over the next kind of three or four years, you can see that kind of gap increasing on the savings requirement increasing. In fact, the total challenge by the time we get to 26, 27 is 155 million. We've never had that level of challenge. So that will be the required savings we need to make by the time we get to that year if our assumptions around various things such as government funding turn out to be true. So a significant challenge over the medium term. I, I, I think most people on this call will be kind of fully aware that the, the, when the government um, announced their autumn statement, Although there's a certain amount of um, kind of pressure within the next two years, the, the can was to to a certain extent kind of kick down the road with the big kind of pressure on, on on addressing the shortfall in public finances pushed out to years three and four. And that's why you can see those very big kind of saving um, budget gaps opening up in those later years. On to the next slide. So what, what this shows is the actual savings we've identified in the MTFS and how they're split between efficiency savings and service reductions. And you can kind of see that actually there's a pretty small amount, 7%, 4.2 million of service reductions. By far, the great majority of savings is going to come through efficiencies. And you can see at the bottom of that slide where the where the key area of proposed service reduction will, will be. So those, those kind of sub bullet points starting from shy grants, working their way down to self in, uh, health improvement services. So where the savings are, but I would stress that they are, you know, a, a very small minority in terms of the total savings we, we, we've got to achieve. On to the next slide. So in, in terms of the, um, the, the criteria that that members generally do in terms of making decisions on service reductions, and they're, they're all kind of listed down there. I mean, the, the two that I'd stress, which has been a kind of key focus of the administration of recent years, is really protecting vulnerable people. So the impact on, on vulnerable in, individuals of some of these savings is one of the key criteria. The other thing I'll point out is consultation feedback. So there's a consultation on the on the budget, you know, the process we're going through now. But when we come to some of those other savings, they will go through the usual process, which is going to be a report to cabinet to kickstart the consultation, proper consultation with the those groups impacted by those savings, generally kind of residents and various different services or groups. The, the results of that consultation will come back to cabinet and then a decision will be made on those savings. So there's, although we've got to set out the high level strategic approach to the budget, there's clearly a lot of detailed work that will need to take place over the coming months and a lot of that will take place kind of spring and summer kind of next year. Go to the next slide. It, this this slide shows shows two things. So it shows the, the budget in in 22, 23 and it shows how that compares to what the forecast budget will be in 26, 27 and it looks at that both through expenditure and and income. And I think that the, the key things that jump out from this, although we've talked a lot about savings so far in this presentation, actually the overall county council budget will grow. So the budget this year is around kind of 504 million and we expect that to grow to 627. And really that that is to do with the inflationary pressure we've got we've, we've got to address and also that growth in demand. So despite those savings, we think the, the overall budget will will increase. And what you can see by looking at the expenditure side, you'll see that there's been a fairly kind of big increase in terms of 
adult adult social care and children's social care kind of expenditure. So they're accounting for an increasing proportion of the overall county council's budget just to do with the demands principally around kind of demographics on those budgets plus the inflation the impact. There are increases to things like highways and transportation, but again, that's slightly misleading because the most of that increase is actually on um, special education needs, transport and disability transport pressures. So again, relates back to social care pressures rather than kind of anything around kind of highways and, 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 and road maintenance. The, 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 the other departmental budgets are actually pretty static. So you can kind of see that the, the what's, what's using up the county council's resources is, 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 is social care expenditure. Next slide. Similar to the revenue budget, we, we've got extreme pressure on the capital project. That the, 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 the capital programme is very large, it's a bit over half a billion pounds over over four years. And if you look on the, the right hand side, kind of shows where the capital expenditure is going to be spent into the broad um, spending blocks and the left hand side is where the funding comes from. So if I, if I kick, kick off with the expenditure side, so the key pressure on the county council's budget is really around population and housing growth. And I think, again, most people on this call will be familiar with the fact that, that within Leicester and Leicestershire, we're looking at over 90,000 new homes being built over the next kind of 15 to 20 years. That has a massive impact in terms of pressures on on school places. And you can see a bit over £100 million being spent on additional school places over the next four years. And the other key pressure is really on highways infrastructure. And you see that kind of big figure on, in terms of the block on the top left hand, top left hand corner. And again, some big highway schemes in there. Martin Mowbray Distributor Road being, being the biggest. Again, big, big kind of pressures around around there. The, the, the rest of the capital programme is kind of, again, a lot smaller. That counts for probably, probably getting on for two thirds of the capital programme. In, in terms of the funding, a lot of that is funded by kind of specific grants. You can see kind of again on the left hand side, a big element that comes from, from specific grants from, from central government predominantly. The, 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 the other kind of funding issue worth pointing out is the is that block with a bit of 100 million pounds to 129 million pounds in terms of funding from other sources. That's principally going to come from borrowing. So we'll be looking to reduce that over over the kind of next kind of few years. Hopefully, through if we get bits of underspend, we'll try and reduce that. But that's going to be a huge pressure on the budget in terms of the need to borrow. Again, we'll seek to internally borrow, but I dare say we're going to have to do some external borrowing from the market. Again, which will, within turn, bring its own kind of pressure on the um, on on the revenue budget. Move to the next slide. So in terms of we listed a, like a few kind of frequently asked questions, the, the first one is kind of will the government step in to help us? Well, I think the answer to that is, is no. And to be honest, I don't think we particularly want them to step in because if they're stepping in, it means we're, we're failing. So the, the, the key focus for us is to make sure that we can keep a balanced budget. The government is, is very much kind of focused on a, on a national level in terms of public finances. Um, the second one is, can we just hunker down until this passes, kind of use reserves? <clears throat> well, we, we know from kind of experience of other authorities, if you do that, you're generally going to get yourself into, into real difficulty. If you use reserves to kind of address savings, you've still got to make those savings. You just kick the can down the road for a year or two. And what it generally means is, is you have to make two or three years savings all in one go. And given the kind of levels of savings that we're looking at, that just wouldn't be possible. So it's just not a sensible approach. Again, we don't have to look too far away to see what happens when you try that approach. Northampton just kind of spring to mind. And you've also got other local authorities that are close by, such as Nottingham and Peterborough, but they've also got into great difficulty by adopting just that kind of approach. The, the third one is, are we going to go bust? No, we're not. We're not going to go bust. As I said, you can see we've got a balanced budget for 23-24. Pressures do increase thereafter. There's no there's no doubt about it. We've got a plan. I can see that we can get through 24-25. It's going to be tough. There's going to be some tough decisions and some tough things we're going to need to, need to make. But but we're not in a position where we're going to be going bust kind of any time soon. And actually, because we've always taken a decision to kind of address these issues early. 
I think we're probably in a better position to many other puppeteer authorities, which probably that kind of answers the final question in, in terms of why we publicise our position. It gets the organisation in a far better position to address the issue if you're kind of public with it and you're honest with yourself in terms of the scale of the issues that we're, we're facing. I'm not going to go through all these uncertainties. There's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of uncertainty uncertainty out there. I'll just mention a few of them. We haven't got all our specific kind of grant allocations. Public health is one that springs to mind, but we haven't got all of them through yet. Again, could be good news, could be some bad news in that. We'll have to wait and, wait and see. Inflation, as I mentioned, is a is a is a huge uncertainty. And and as we're kind of, I think we're more or less kind of in recession at the moment as a country. Again, the impact of what that will be both on service demand and on things like council tax collection. Again, some big some big uncertainties around that, uh, as will be the the impact in terms of the reduction in living standards that's that's expected over the next two years. Again, we're not really certain what that will impact, how that will impact on our, our demand for services. So just a big caveat there, uncertainties everywhere. Um, just on consultation, the, the consultation actually closes until the 15th of January, but, but as I mentioned, there will be other opportunities, particularly on some of the more contentious and difficult savings where we'll be doing kind of more detailed consultation over the spring and summer for, for people to have to have their say. So I'd urge you to kind of respond to the consultation, but uh, as I say, there, but there'll, be, there'll be more opportunities to, to respond on the more detailed savings over, over the remainder of this, this, this calendar year. I'm going to stop there, and I think it's we're, we're you, open uh, to questions and discussion. You, thank you, thank you, Chris. So uh, you can see what our problems are going forward. Obviously, we've got massive uncertainty. Our other main problem, really, is the growth in uh, the budgets of elderly persons' care and children's care, and all that is underwritten by a manifesto pledge to uh, protect the vulnerable. So that causes us uh, grief. Then, of course, what we nobody expected when we kicked off with this administration was inflation, you know, hitting 10, 11 percent. So that all automatically, uh, well, not automatically, but it also increases our problems and therefore increases uh, uh, increases council tax. So we're in, in between the devil and the deep blue sea, but um, we'll take any questions you've got. If they're political questions, myself or Deborah will ask them. If they're money questions, Lee or Chris Tambida will answer them. So I see I've got good old Jeffrey Kaufman. Welcome, Jeffrey. You're first. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yep. I can hear I can hear, you, but I only see half of you, Jeffrey. Oh, right. we'll try and put the better half in. Uh, look. Ever since I've been around at County Hall and before and now, we've been talking about being the lowest funded local authority. Uh, and I know you spent a lot of time and everybody spent a lot of time trying to improve matters. <coughs> now really has to be the time. Um, and I just wondered what plans you've got once again to go down well, and get some levelling up. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for that, Jeffrey. As you say, you've been around a long time and I've known you a long time as well. Um, we have actually now managed to get a meeting through the members of parliament going to see uh, the chancellor. We have now got a meeting scheduled where we're going to go and actually sit down with the members of parliament and with the chancellor to see if we can, see if we can get anywhere. The problem we've had is the fair funding review and stuff like that. I think the government have probably park that in the long grass because they've got so many other problems to deal with. So I think a meeting uh, with a strategy about how we can help us will be useful. And I thank the members of parliament for organising it. And we will we will go down there myself and, and Deborah and see what we can do. OK, uh, Mary D, I bet that's Mary. Sorry, Geoffrey. No, no, thank you for the answer, but um, okay. it's frustrating. Tell me about it, Jeffrey. I've never had it. I've been leader ten and a half years, and every year I had to make savings. Uh, Mary. Uh, yes, thank you. Two questions. One regarding the possibility of two hundred and fifty posts uh, being made, well, deleted permanently. Is there a 
method of doing that in order to prevent one particular service from having a more direct hit uh -huh. than others? Um, and my second question, you mentioned demands by increased housing build. That also brings in increased council tax, which you haven't referred to. So how does that work out in the equation? Presumably that's good news, but that must help in some way, as well as causing you headaches. Indeed Thank you. Is, Can I ask Chris to reply about the strategy about how we do consult uh, on any potential job losses? Chris? In terms of that headline 250, I, I do think most of it will be able to manage through just kind of managing the overall work, workforce. I don't think there'll be very much in the way of compulsory redundancies. In, term, in terms of kind of where they'll fall, I mean, you just need to look at, through the list of the savings and you'll be able to kind of follow where, where, where the big savings areas are and where the redundancy w would be. But I say, I do think we will be able to manage it kind of in a, in a sensible way. And if you look at the overall size of the budget, the budget is still growing. It's just that it's grown in, in some areas, it's grown and some areas it's not so not, not growing. So we are looking at in terms of how we can have some kind of redeployment policies across the whole authority to make sure we really do limit the amount of um, impact on staffing. Yeah, uh, to be honest, Mary, uh, people at work for us type of know uh, where there's likely to be savings and they also know where there's likely to be growth. So as Chris says, generally speaking, with natural waste, which is people retiring and stuff and people being in the trade, if you know what I mean, as officers, the type of move. So there's very few compulsory redundancies. Uh, on the demands on housing, obviously we do get growth. So, sorry, could I just go back on that? Because you're looking at managing staff and et cetera. I'm looking at it from the services that will be lost to constituents. And my question was, you know, how do you prevent one big hit on one particular service? Because X number of people have retired in that department. How do you make sure it's across the board in order to try and protect services at some level? Well, obviously, if when you when you have people leave, if you have people leave in certain areas and they need recruit they need recruiting, we will still be recruiting. So in adult social care and children's social care, Deborah will tell you we are incredibly short of people in there in there now. But in the situation we're in, Mary, obviously some there will be a diminution in services in some areas going forward. If we haven't got the money to provide them all, there ultimately will be a diminution in services. But I'll let Deborah just comment on the on the children's question in particular, because that is ex exceptionally difficult. Deborah. Yeah, I think, Mo, just to really sort of over cover your questions, it's really about how we're changing how we deliver services. So we're making efficiency savings. So we're delivering the same service, but in a different way. So that's where you'll see naturally staff go down in or in go up. But specifically in children and adults, we are recruiting for social workers constantly because we can't get them. So there's still a lot of recruitment happening at the county council. But as we look at how we deliver the services within the budget envelope we've got, there will be some natural wastage where people will move departments, people will retire, people will take voluntary redundancy. So I don't think we'll be laying off, you know, loads of people, but there will be still recruiting people as we go. But um, I'll just let Chris come in and just answer your question about the, the council tax. And obviously, as we build more houses, we get more council tax. So I'll just let Chris answer that final question for you. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's a good point because you're right. As as the houses go up, we get we get more in council tax. The, the issue that we have is is generally you need to build the road before before the houses are built, and you, you kind of need to be to build the school before it's kind of fully occupied. So you have you have a, you have a, definitely you've got you've got a cash flow kind of issue there, and generally council tax doesn't pay for capital. So council tax will pay for those ongoing service demands that we've got. We want to pay for those upfront capital costs, hence why we've got a particular problem around the capital programme. Excuse me. OK, OK, thank you for that, Chris. So the next person we've got is, is Ray. Good morning, Ray. Hi, Nick. Uh, thank you. Um, 
102 million pounds allocated to the provision of schools, etc. Can we not swing some of that on to the developers of these individual housing developments? It seems an awful lot of money. And even if we only got a percentage back, it's got to be worth investigating. Or maybe there's, I'm being a bit simplistic. Over to you, please. You're not being simplistic, Ray. Uh, what we expect developers to do is where they're putting in houses that require a school, they have to pay for it in its entirety. I think that's correct, isn't it, Deborah? I'll let Chris come in, but yes, most of it is from developer, but some of it is from DfE grants as well. I mean, uh, over the over the last kind of decade or so, we've been we've kind of more or less made sure that schools are funded by a combination of developer contributions or central government grant. So we, we haven't we haven't really kind of dipped into, I suppose, county council resources to fund schools. So we, we do really try and maximise developer contributions. Ha having said that, you can kind of see we still get reasonably sized grants from central government because that can't fully pay for the uh, all the demands around kind of education. But yeah, it, it's generally developer contributions and central government grants. OK, thank, yes, thanks for the answer. On. Yeah, can you just, it's still 102 million. Just seems an awful lot of money if it's going, by and large, being color, covered by developer contributions. Is, is there no way we can get that um, reduced? Here's my question. Where is 102 million going uh, at this point? I think a lot of it is inflation costs. If you look at the, what we were budgeting for, for for schools, it's gone way up because of the construction costs. So we have to provide the school places. We have to to, you know, give the schools they have to be energy efficient and all those sort of things, which obviously costs a lot more money now than they used to. But um, we do get most of that from that. And you'll be surprised at how many houses across the county uh, get high money in for schools. And that all goes towards providing those additional school places. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, that, I mean that, that that's correct. And on top of, on top of just the school places, there is the, there is the kind of the the condition work as well. So there's a lot of maintenance as well. I think in total there's about 300 odd schools within Leicestershire. So it's although it sounds like a lot of money, that is over a four year period. And I say there are an awful lot of schools and an awful lot of demands on that budget. OK, thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Cheers, Ray. I've got a, a, it just says Councillor L and no face. You're next. And then you're after Councillor L, it's you, Andy. Councillor L, oh, there you are. Oh, it's John. Um, yes, your nemesis. Ah, yeah, your good nemesis, morning. Nick. Good afternoon, John. Hope you good are. afternoon, Nicholas. Um, district councils hold an awful lot of um, 106 monies that are not being spent, whether it's on doctor's surgeries, whether it's on new schools, because of the mismatch in the current system. That money is just simply not spent. And indeed, if the money is not spent within an X period of time, as you're aware, as a as a district finance man, Nick, is it has to be sent back to the developer with interest, and the work doesn't get done, and then it's placing a uh, burden, particularly on county council with its uh, with its services and having to find school places, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which adds to the cost. Don't you think, Nick, that it's about time that uh, we as councillors, whatever perishing party we are started putting pressure on Westminster to start reforming the system is that when 106 monies are uh, uh, given, dictated to and signed by the developer, um, that uh, we put pressure on them to actually carry out the work, whether it's a GP practice that doesn't, um, doesn't uh, make a private decision as a private practice not to develop the land that was required by the NHS in the first place. There is a whole match mismatch in the system, which is adding burden on Leicestershire County Council services. But the money is there, but it's not being spent. I I, I really take uh, take Ray Morris's point on um, where can we get this money from? Let's look at the 106s, Nick. Can I just take that first, Nick, before you come in, just to highlight some of the work we've done, because I'm chair of the Police and Crime Panel. We've just done a huge piece of work that looks at Section 106 funding that's sitting in all across Leicestershire yeah. in all the district's bank accounts about there was I think it off the top of my head was 17 million pounds worth of Section 106 that was sitting in district bank accounts yeah. for police. So if you care to look, I can either get the link sent out to you, you can just have a look. It's a police and crime plan. We've just done a working party, Section 106, and we're starting to unlock that money that's sitting in district bank accounts. But I agree with you. If we had one 
Section 106 agreements across the whole of the county that were all the same yep. rather than seven yep. different ones for, yep. for all the different districts about their criteria about how police or the NHS get that money out yep. it would make life a lot simpler and a lot of that money would be unlocked that's sitting in districts bank accounts because we don't have hardly anything sitting in our bank accounts but when you start looking at the districts they have huge amounts of section yeah. 106 yeah it's incredibly difficult for the police, for the NHS, for all those other partners to get that money out of the district's bank account. So I'm fully with you. There's huge pockets of money sitting there that needs to be spent within local communities. And we really not need to start looking locally about how we unlock that money. So the police is being unlocked. I know the NHS are really interested in the report we've done. So I'd urge you to go and read that and start sort of thinking how we can work across the whole of the county and all the districts to get that money spent in local communities where it's a real benefit and where that money should be spent for all that development that residents have taken. Anything well, uh, so can I just ask Chris Tambini what we do about the district sitting uh, holding money, uh, John? Do we do anything, Chris? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have we do have a team that seeks to co coordinate the whole Section 106 process. So, so yeah, but, but I, I mean, I don't know the detail because obviously some of it's for for, for district services and some of it be for county services. So, I dare say there's a certain amount that's kind of ha held for those other public services as well. But I, d I don't know the detail of it, Nick. I certainly agree with you, John. It's a very disjointed system and not in the best interests of um, the electorate, but. We are where we are with this, I'm afraid. Finally, Nick, then, wouldn't a unitary authority be better and be able to coordinate all this stuff in a more positive way? I'll leave it at that, that, Chair. I think, I think John, I'd be uh, advised not to comment on unitary authority, <laughs> uh, bearing in mind that uh, I'm a district councillor as well, and we've got district council elections uh, coming up in May, and uh, <laughs> commented on unitary authorities before, and it's not gone down particularly well amongst district council colleagues. So I'm oh, not make any comment can i go to uh, andy next please thank you nick um one observation on the balance between capex and revenue now this might be rather naive but but in the business sense you deploy capex to try and improve and upgrade those areas of business that cause you the greatest problem and yet it, it's clear from the pie charts that chris showed us that our biggest headache, if I call it that, is social care. And yet the amount of capex that's being deployed towards social care, I quickly read as five million, which was which was seemed trivial in relation to some of the other areas of investment through through capital programs. That's the first observation. Um, is there anything that we can do with capex locally within within Leicestershire? in order to improve efficiency and service delivery within social care. Um, my second observation builds on Mary's um, comment. We understand why any employment organisation uses natural wastage um, as a means of managing workforce reduction. But the downside is it's unplanned and random. If you have post freezes, um, you don't know where you're going to lose people and you'll also lose the best people first um, and therefore natural wastage whilst I understand that it won't upset the trade unions um, to the same extent it will probably cause as many headaches as it solves I'll leave it there thank you Nick so sorry my camera's playing oh it's because my battery my battery's gone really low Chris can you explain to him uh We'll explain to Andy how much money historically we've spent on adults and children social care. Yeah, I mean it's it's it's, it's actually a, it's, a, it's a really interesting point actually that capex because because you, you are right our, our our issues around are around social care. The, the the issue with social care, particularly around kind of adults and actually to a large extent children, is 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 a lot of it is outsourced. So you, a lot of the, the 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 capital is actually kind of private capital, be it kind of private sector kind of um, nursing homes or adult social care homes. So we don't really have that demand around capital that we do have on, say, SCORG, where we where we own the asset. Having said that, there, there is one of the areas where we've, which we are actively exploring, looking at savings, is around the better use of IT and technology around social care. So there is a certain amount of investment that we're putting into that to try and make revenue savings in terms of kind of how, how we go about kind of providing social care. So 
the, the, I suppose in short, that I mean the, the, the big demand around capital is is is, is kind of is, is kind of outsourced. Hence, why we haven't got that big that, that big issue. But but we are looking at investment, I could say, around the kind of IT. If I could have a go at the the workforce one as well, if that's okay. I, was, I probably wasn't that clear to be honest. I think the 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 the, the, that, that, the, the natural wastage is kind of part of the solution. So it it isn't the solution. So we will be looking at redeployment, but but overall it's not a, that big an issue. Just because even when you look at those overall figures, our our budget is growing. It is growing. Although we need to make savings, the budget is growing. So hence why I don't think the issue around workforce is too big an issue. But I do take your point that you wouldn't just do it through through natural wastage because you, you you'd come to some bizarre kind of outcome at the end of the day. But it's part of a package of various things we'll be looking at. But I don't think it particularly is not a big issue for the county council. No, I, we'll I, just, I, we'll, I would just end up with a lot of accountants and no social workers, Chris. Nothing wrong with that. I recognise <laughs> the, the, the repeated mantra that we are increasing the size of budgets, but the, the budgets are not increasing at the same rate as general inflation. And therefore, um, we may be increasing the financial value under a particular budget header, but the costs within that budget header have far outstripped any increases that we that we that we may have built in very good point andy and absolutely correct that's the problem we're facing because even if you know with inflation at 10 percent plus the increase in demand we're, we're always playing catch up we, we, we just cannot get there with our level of funding that's why the group are having to consider some pretty serious and politically sensitive andy if i'm honest uh, savings to be made but We've always prided ourselves as administration on protecting the vulnerable, which we'll continue to do, and run a tight ship. And if we have to make tough decisions, we will make them. We will never, ever be a Northampton. But thank you for your comments, Andy. OK, I've got Councillor M. I'm sorry, I can't see your name again because it's just a red yellow box. It's a joy to be back with you once more. Councillor M. Christmas and the new year. Can you see the councillor M, Deborah, on your big oh, I screen? I can't see anyone's oh, hand up. Now. Aha, there you go. Kirsty, good morning. Or is it Christy? No, no it's, it's me. I was just coming on to say I've got no other hands raised, Leader. Okay, I can't see, see any hands on the raised. Left. Okay, well, if we haven't got any others, um, please respond to the consultation. Oh, Mary Drake, Mary D's back. Mary. Mic's off, Mary. Not used to teams. Um, there's this system in the county regarding disabled adaptations where districts refer, sorry, where people have to first go to Blaby Council, who's the centre. They decide whether the county does major adaptations, district do minor adaptations, and it goes round and round and round. Right, and I have a lady who's been in hospital twice and all she wants is a handrail, right? So even the basics aren't being done. So is it possible to relook at that particular system to see whether it's actually working? I think it's called light bulb, whether it's actually working effectively as it could do. Mary, I'll, I'll answer that for you. There is, it is called the light bulb system, you are right, but Charm would sit out of the main body they may administrate it themselves rather than through the blaby one so charmwood actually aren't joined with the other districts so it's um more of a charmwood issue than a county issue uh, you could you check that please because i believe that's not the case but if you could check it out for me thank you thank you mary well as i was, as I was about to summarize thank you for attending it's been good to speak with you and don't forget we've got the consultation which is out there uh, please uh, please uh, try and reply to the consultation because we do take notice of it so we've uh, we were scheduled for an hour and a bit we looks like we're done in 45 so you've all got a spare <coughs> spare half hour so thank you very much indeed thank you bye-bye